there is no web two and web three division. It's not a thing. Web three is grows on the substrate of web two. So like web three is this little ownership layer that is completely dependent on web two. There's no true separation. There's an ideological separation in how we engage with networks, but you cannot do web three without a web two presence. What's happening, guys? How are we feeling? Dude, feeling so good. <laughs> yeah, right? yeah. So good. It's so good. <laughs> FT Now podcast. You know, what's not to love? There we go. There we go. Who we got lined up today? We have got Dave Krugman, founder of All Ships, uh, a renowned photographer and storyteller uh, in his own right, and uh, someone who is a technologist pushing the space forward. 100%, man. I'm just like really excited to hear about his use of technology to drive uh, the conversation around content and not content highlighting the the technology, right? So I think that element of Web3 is really, really at the core of his liking. And then I'm also just so, so fascinated by his use of like ancillary technologies or ancillary concepts such as mycelium and mushrooms to kind of explain what's going on within the space and within Web3 and just super stoked to dive into mental health with them. Yeah, for sure. I mean, Dave very much is one of the the pioneering photographers in the space. It was great um, hearing how he's continuing to engage and grow his community and the, the nuance between one of ones and open editions and his strategy for continuing to to grow his community without necessarily detracting from his early supporters. I think the advice he has for emerging artists was spot on. And I think even outside of his own career as a, as a creative and as a photographer, he's also been doing incredible things with his community, all ships, lots of uh, IRL programming. We speak about the importance of IRL community development uh, amongst many other things. So very excited to dive deeper into this conversation. Before we do, if you haven't already, please make sure you've subscribed to our NFT Now newsletter, where we simplify everything that's happening in the market into an actionable digest once each week. It's at nftnow.com. But without any further ado, let's get into this week's show. Dave Krugman. Hey. Super excited to have you. Thanks Dude, for having me. It's been a long time coming. Yeah, I've been very, very eager and excited to have this conversation with you. We wanted to have you in season one, and then the, the timings didn't work, and then you had so many interesting things happening. We were like, we got to do it for season two. We yeah. got to make it happen. I'm actually glad it's season two because I have so much more to talk about. Well, let's get into it, man. Like, look, when we talk about the difference between web two and web three, like your career often comes to mind because we think about, like, about how you built a really big following uh, on Instagram as a photographer, navigating the Web2 space, um, and have now taken that into the Web3 space. Um, tell us a little bit about the problems that you and other photographers faced in Web2 and how Web3 is empowering in those regard. Uh, yeah, great question. Uh, I think I need to start this answer by saying that my kind of core thesis is that all value is rooted in community. And the different technologies that you just talked about are all really effective community building tools. And you know, to get to the problem part first, uh, let's just dive into the fact that you know most online economies prior to uh, blockchain economies and, and art creator economies on blockchain specifically, most of those economies are like the only currency really is attention, and it's really inefficient to convert attention into USD because there's so many people and so many different layers in the way that have to facilitate that you know, transaction that the, cre the creator who's actually making the thing that people want access to kind of like get left in the dust and the intermediaries that facilitate the distribution of that content end up taking the lion's share. I mean, how many like hundreds of billions of dollars are generated through social media uh, and you know, the social media companies basically take you know, if not 100%, close to 100% of those advertising profits for the ads that are sold against the, the content that the creators are making. Uh, I think my favorite thing that's happening with blockchain technologies and NFTs specifically is it's giving us a lot of leverage to kind of renegotiate that deal we have with the internet. That's pretty awesome. Like, let's talk about that, it, like, that renegotiation, right? I think you bring up a really interesting point. Um, from that perspective, like, what does that look like? And what... It, what are some of the effects that you're seeing happening with that renegotiation? And I think to double down on it, it's like, what are some of the resistance that we're seeing from a creative perspective? And then what are some of the wins that we're seeing from a creative perspective? Oh, great questions. Um, let's see. So I think that the main thing I'm seeing is that 
you can build much more engaged and uh, participatory communities when you use NFTs because people actually have skin in the game. If I'm following somebody on Instagram and I'm a part of their, you know, attention economy, it's very easy for me to just walk away and be like, yeah, I'm bored, bored with this storyline and I'm going to go follow somebody else. I also have a very limited amount of attention in every 24 hour you know, block. Um, and so what NFTs do is it allows me to pay attention to stories that can take place longer than that circadian, you know, content cycle. And because I have a little asset, for example, you know, if you have one of my drip drops or something, you know, you have that and you can like jump back into my storyline anytime you want, because that's a much longer narrative that I'm telling. And what that also allows is for you to have your, um, incentives aligned with mine, because you have this little asset that will appreciate in time, as long as I am continuing to like innovate and push forward and build more community. And so, you know, my wins are your wins, your wins are my wins in that regard. And I just never experienced that with social media. I think the other interesting thing is like the entire economy of the internet until pretty recently from a creator's perspective, it's a very um, double-edged sword. One is that, you know, the good part is that we get distribution. Mm -hmm. So we in like 2011, 2012, as Instagram started to really blow up and everybody had a smartphone with a camera on it, all of a sudden we are the publishers. We get to circumvent all these, you know, global publishing companies, and people were very quickly able to build bigger audiences than top magazines had, right? So that gives us an incredible amount of reach and penetration of our, you know, ideas into society. Uh, the the trade off and the deal that I want to renegotiate is that we kind of signed away all the distribution rights to the content we create, and we said you can make as much money as you can figure out how to make by selling advertising in my self-published little magazine on Instagram. And I'm never going to question that. I'm never going to you know, ask for any part of that money back. Um, and so I think that as the technology and tools evolve, we have a new way to make a living and to make economies on the internet. And that way is that basically you can think of NFTs as this like um, decentralized crowdfunding uh, mechanic. And so instead of me building up a, enough attention to sell ads to brands to my audience, I can get like kind of issue these like um, uh, pieces of artwork to my community and say, you know, if a hundred of you can give me 0.2 ETH, like that's enough for me to continue my creative career. And I don't have to think about the commercial side of the internet. And so I, I really, my, I think for creatives, the ideal is to, to dabble in both worlds. But I do hope that as this technology evolves, we can increasingly, you know, decouple creatives from commercial interests that are can be very um, misaligned with uh, the the intent of the artist. So let, let's talk about the building the collector base. I think it's really important. You are an inc a prolific artist, like a prolific photographer. I would dare to say you're one of our generation's best, right? Um, I think you have an incredible way of utilizing technology to drive photography forward versus using photography to drive technology forward. Or we can say that it's a paradox almost like, you know, there's so many artists that are seeing the nft community succeed create life-changing money right but they don't see the hard work that an artist puts in behind the scenes right they may see the tweets they may see the on-chain data you know they may see these elements like what are some of like the tips of or guidance that you would give yourself knowing what you know today what's the advice that you'd give yourself when you were starting out i i mean i think it would be what i started the podcast with which is like all value is rooted in community. Even money, cash, like everything that we use as a token of exchange is has something to do with um, building community, mm -hmm. working within communities, moving value through space. So let, and let, time. let's dive deeper into that. So what is community? What are the pillars of what makes a strong community for an artist? Uh, I think that showing up, being consistent, being authentic, being yourself. I think it's, you know, a lot of people see what works for other people and then they try to mimic it and they're, you're just always going to be in someone else's wake. Like there's no way that ever works. What you have to do is just identify what you love doing as an artist, iterate, repeat, grow, use the internet as a feedback loop. Mm -hmm. And every day you're going to improve a little bit more, have conversations, add value. There's a million ways to add value. You can come in, you can talk to people, you can elevate other people. Like I try to do with all ships. I try to write articles about people and just, just show up and participate in the conversation. 
And if you do that, like you are a magnet for other people. And, you know, all my participation in all of these online economies is based on network theory. And also, you know, I'm, I'm sure we're going to get into this too. But yeah, like, we definitely oh, yeah. are. I, I already see, know. I I'm I'm, I'm, I'm perched. I'm perched. But before we get before we get into mushroom talk, um, I, I, I want to uh, double down on this. And I think that you have been uh, very intentional about how you have released different projects alongside one of one pieces um, to thoughtfully expand grow, and grow your community and also drive attention and value back towards that core. Um, let's talk about that. Obviously, you have your one of ones on Super Rare and, and other platforms. You've got your drive uh, project with the cars. You've got the drip, the drip drop, like which I think also had some really interesting generative elements. Tell us a little bit about how you have strategically sort of thought each of these projects through and how they contribute to the overall ecosystem of your artistic output? That's a great question. And that's one I love talking about. So basically, what makes sense to me in interconnected online communities is that, you know, people who reward the people that support them are going to win. So, I mean, I, if somebody gives me any amount of support in my career as an artist, I will never forget it. And one way to never forget it is to literally consider every person who's invested in you in any way and find ways to make those investments either whole or either, you know, worthwhile, right? And so when I started thinking about this stuff, I actually dropped my first NFTs in November 2020 on Block Party. Shout out Vlad Ginsburg. Yo, shout, shout out, out to Vlad. Vlad. Also got, one of my biggest your, collectors. Yo, I have yeah. one of your Genesis pieces. I know, yo, yeah. I, I went I went searching yeah. for that for months. You're like, yo, there's my I was like, yo, where's your Genesis? Because you rugged me on the drives, and that's okay. I'm still getting over <laughs> we that. We gotta talk I'm about that too. Yeah, you rugged my boy. My yeah. drive, yeah. My yeah. drive yeah. is looking really yeah. pretty over there. Looking real pretty over there. I'm still going to therapy. I'm still going to therapy for that one, you know? It's good for you. Yeah, I know, but um, I went in on a search for your Genesis and I found it. So thanks yeah. for that. Yeah. Well, thanks, thanks to Vlad for facilitating that and, and his generosity. Um, but anyway, my point being is that that was during a time where there's almost no photography on blockchain yet. There, I was not the first. I'm not claiming that. But I, I was very early. And I basically had to wait a while to really like drop more projects. And what that gave me was gave me time to, you know, look at the whole community and be like, how do I elevate different voices in this community and, and tell the stories of artists in a slower way than social media? But it also gave me time to kind of watch what happened in the landscape and all the different drop mechanics that were coming out and all the different artist ideas, like people like Mad Dog Jones and Fuocious and uh, Jay and Silva, Thank You X, like all these people were doing really interesting things. And I didn't get onto Super Rare until like, I don't know, May 2021. But by then I saw the whole landscape already kind of unfolding. And I was like, I know exactly how to do this. I love that you just mentioned Super Rare at May 2021 in a sense of like almost being late to it. Everything's relative, right? Everything's yeah. right, very yeah. relative. Yeah, yeah. But to, yeah. to answer your question, so yeah. I, I dropped my Super Rare Genesis piece. Um, and uh the artist, I mean not the artist, the collector, uh 33 NFT collected it. We love um, 33. 33 yeah, is amazing. Guy. Yeah, he's an incredible, incredible guy. Incredible patron of the arts. He's like a true patron of the arts. Yeah, so 100%. Really. Um, and, you know, so I dropped that. And then the guy, the guys from Guppy, Benny and Will and Ian bought my next one. And then, I, you know, I sold a few more along the way. And I realized from watching other people that it's really hard to build a community one, one of one at a time. And so I was like, okay, the next thing I need to do is to build a much wider collection to welcome in you know, a bigger community of invested advocates, right? So I started thinking about all the different bodies of work that I've been building over the past you know, 15 years, 20 years of my life. And I realized that what's more collectible than cars? Like cars are already have like a deep collector I don't base. I want to talk about this. There, right there's you know, Hot Wheels and micro machines I used to collect. And I was like, oh my God, I've been doing this project uh, on Instagram called Secret Street for over a decade. And one of the themes that I collected for that project was these, you know, cars all shot from the side, you know. And uh, so I decided to do that. But then I was like, how do I make sure that my, I didn't want to, for the people that spent so much money on me buying one of ones, because they spent a lot. I was like, oh my God, yeah. this is life changing. I was like, how do I make sure that they don't view this as diluting their, you know, investment in me? And so I was like, oh, I will explain the whole project to them. I will make this one of the best projects I possibly can. 
and I will make sure that all my one of one holders get access and first dibs on the on the entire collection. I think I gave them three cars each or something wow. like that. Love it. Yeah, and, makes sense. Yeah, and so they got they got first pick too. So like thirty three chose like you know all these amazing cars, and then you know Silver Surfer chose a bunch of other cars, and and the Guppy guys chose three cars. And as the floor price of Drive rose, I mean Drive ended up doing really well. Like went kind of viral. The the highest auction went for like twenty three point eight 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 E. And you also gamified it yeah. too. Yeah. And then yeah. I gamified yeah. it in a way that yeah. gives gives longevity to the project. I mean, I still have 12 trophies in my garage yeah. that people can fight me for in these creative battles online. So it also helps um, the longevity of the project because I have all these incentive tokens, but that's, we can have that conversation yeah. too. But point being, the, the floor of drive is even today, I think it's like 3.69. So everyone who bought, you know, if you just do the simple math of how much like ETH to ETH, of, if you invested in my first one of ones, and you still held your three drive cars, you know, you have oh, more than you spent on my one of one and just the drive series, right? But once the floor of drive became kind of inaccessible to the community, I knew that I could, I, I had an opportunity to further expand my community. I think about these like rings, right? Like yeah. keep, keep building out the rings and the rings always have arrows that, and, and conduits that like feed each other. And so when I did drip drop, I was like, I'm going to increase my supply by 1,111 tokens. But if you hold a drive, you get a free drip, right? Um, the highest non-auction price for uh, a drive car was 0.5. Mm -hmm. And the floor price on drips today is 0.5. So literally the mathematics of this at this moment make perfect sense to me. Where if you bet on me, you know, in, in September 2021, 20, when I dropped drive, now you can, like, just because of that one free claim, plus you could have minted another one at 0.2, your art, like your investment is already good. And so I think that's the way that artists should think about, you know, expanding their collection while not diluting their early investors. I hope I hope that uh, all connects and makes sense. But. Yeah, we're sending them to therapy. So <laughs> I appreciate it. You know, my <laughs> I love that too. And I think it's, uh, it's amazing to see you continue to experiment and bring forth different ways to engage and grow your community. I'm curious though, for, for artists that are a bit earlier on in their career that are trying to uh, build up their collector base in the space, obviously it's there's a lot of artists. And as you mentioned earlier in this conversation, there's a bit of a limited pie when it comes to different people that are actively collecting and purchasing NFTs. So I'm curious on one side, how you can actually, as an artist, start to drive sales, build your collector base. And then um, on the second side, like how do we grow the pie overall? Like how did you even start to onboard some of your Web2 community into Web3? Well, first of all, like if you're new, brand new to this, don't mint anything yet. Come in, get in some spaces, ask questions. We're generally very helpful and friendly. We don't bite. Yeah. <laughs> if you're in a room where people are not being friendly, like a, a Twitter space or something like that, like you're in the just, in, there's so many good people in this space. Just leave. Like you don't need those people. Um, but you need, there's so much to learn. I think of what we're building here as a decentralized global country and we're building the art you know, the art side of that, right? Mm -hmm. And so what that means is not only do we have our own currency, which I think is like largely ETH, there's other currencies, of course, but uh, we also have our own language. And that language has been emergent and developing. It's the GM, it's, it's endless other, you know, little things that we use. And you, you need to really, um, the best way to learn a language is immersion. So if you're a new artist, like brand new, Come in, immerse yourself, start learning what people are talking about. There's so much to learn about wallets, wallet security, minting, different chains. That is, you need to learn that stuff so that you can move with intention. Once you've learned that stuff, I think one of the best ways in this current meta <laughs> to, to grow and to, to lay a foundation for yourself to build upon is probably like do an open edition. And if you, if you sell an open edition and you sell, you know, 10, 20 pieces, you have 20 people that are like in your foundation. Yeah. And those early people that believed in you, you know, as you grow and succeed as an artist, find ways to reward them. Give them allow lists to your next drop. Just grow with that small community of people. The reason I like an open edition as a, as a starting point for artists is it gives them an idea of how many people are interested in their work. It gives them a way to sell a body of work to completion without you know, if you choose to mint 30 pieces at 0.3 and you sell seven, you know, you don't have a secondary market. You, you, ha you have to sell tw uh, 
13 more pieces. I hope I did that math right. <laughs> Check me on that. Um, There's a reason why we're in the creative space, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, if I just did that wrong, I'm so Sounds right. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah sounds right. Um, but like, you don't want to just have pieces sitting out on the primary because it makes it harder to do your next thing because people are like, why would I buy this when these ones, nobody was even interested in this. So think about the perception of your supply and demand. So an OE is a really good way to be to do a few things. Identify who is interested in supporting you, find your first, you know, invested advocates, and then have a sold out collection that you can then iterate on and, and you know, go on and do new things and, and experiment with different mechanics. Um, the other thing I'd say is like, this takes so much time. The people that you see that are making, you know, a million dollars in an hour on an open edition, we're here since like 2020, 2021, or even every earlier. single day or earlier. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like an X copy has been like, dude, he, Tumblr he was, days. He was on Tumblr. Oh, yeah. 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 He was yeah. on Tumblr. You know? <laughs> um, and I remember those days. I yeah. actually, I had a, I had a big Tumblr following too. And Google found one of my rain pictures, a puddle picture. Um, on my Tumblr account that went viral and they bought the rights off me and it's the background of the Google Pixel 2. Let's go. Wow. And, bam, bam. Uh, now you know it. You heard it still, here first. If you Google that, it's still there. Like that picture is mine. And on every Android, because they bought the full rights, like I don't even own it anymore. Um, on every Android phone, I think to this day, it's one of the all wallpaper options. All right, so let me ask is you this like question. Is that like a proto drip drop? It, it, in a way, actually yeah. one of the drips in drip drop is from the same day I shot that. that oh, so let me ask you this question. Did you make more money selling that to Google or did you make more money selling NFTs? I've made more money selling NFTs than I've You heard it I've here made, first, ladies and gentlemen. Than I've made in my entire <laughs> career combined for everything. We'll dive into that um, later, but I wanted to ask you one question. You keep mentioning community and like there's one community that I am so... So bullish on, and that's all ships, you know. And you know how much I love it, you know how much we love it, you know how much we support it, right it, you know. Yeah, you know? Yeah. Represent, um, I'd love to dive into a the ethos of uh what all ship stands for, how we got started, where it's going, and then obviously we can talk offline, but how we can partner together. <laughs> <on it. laughs> that's episode two, yeah. yeah. Um, not so all ships, you know, all ships actually precedes the, the web three space. Um, all ships was, uh, born out of, I'm a very social person. I, I love, I get this from my mom. I love bringing people together. Like, I love cooking for people. I love hosting dinner parties. I love hosting concerts. And I, the happiest I ever am is when I'm sitting in a room full of people I love that are all have like really good vibes and energy. And I see them meeting each other for the first time. And like, I just feel this like buzz in the room. There's actually like an, like a vibe in the room, like an aura of like, everyone's like, oh, this is fucking, this is awesome. And that's when I'm the most happy. So um, back in 2019, uh, I, had a, I have a friend named Isaac Tettenbaum and he's an incredible pianist. And he had a residency at a bar called Lucy Rouge. And we would go there every Monday night and there was no, he would play ragtime piano. And uh, it was kind of like speakeasy vibe bar, like super low light. And I would basically just post on my Instagram account and I would say, hey, like, we're all going to meet at the at Lucy Roos tonight. It's piano night. Like, let's all hang. And we'd go there. But it, because of where it was in this weird basement, there was no service, no cell phone service. You had to go outside to use your phone. And so, like, what it became was this little, like, like isolated bubble of, of social life where we were all really just, like, make, you know, looking into each other's eyes and hanging out and listening to music and drinking. And it was just so fun. And it began to grow like crazy. Like, we'd have, like, First, we had like 20 people, then 30, then 40, then we're spilling out the door and the, the bar owners like get, got, had to get a bouncer and um, it was crazy. And I was like, you know what? Like, I'm really onto something here. I think I'm going to start branding this thing. So I actually made, I wonder if I'm wearing it right now, actually. Is it? Let's go. Come on. Here's the reveal. Here's the reveal. Yes. The first, yes! The first All Ships uh, shirts. So this is a creative coalition. And I started just passing out the shirts. I was like, All Ships Rise with the Tide. Like, let's all stick together. I was already in the point where I was super frustrated with what social media was doing to my the, the mental health of my community. And I was like, we need to move slower. We need to move with more intention. We need to build a space away from social media where we can actually like be human beings again. And that's how all shifts started. Um, then COVID hit. Uh, and basically, we had to stop doing those events, obviously. 
Uh, that bar actually never came back, which is very sad. Um, but it became sauced, which is great. Um, it's a great rebirth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, great yeah, comeback same, story. Same yeah. people, different yeah, bar. Yeah, yeah. But um, I was like, well, I'm not going to stop, you know, talking to creatives. I'm not going to stop building this thing. So I, I took a lot of the money I had made um, from like Web two jobs and stuff like that, and I, I hired a dev and I built up like this infrastructure for the website. And then I, during COVID, I was like, I'm going to DM an artist that I love, you know, maybe a few a week. And I'm just going to interview them in the DMs and I'm going to copy paste it into my like CMS system, hit publish. And then, you know, that I, I would just write articles about different artists. So I started doing that and doing that and doing that. And then over the summer of that same year, Jay and Silva was like, dude, have you seen what's happening with NFTs? And I was like, what are you talking about, dude? What? And he was always really deeply into crypto and I never got it. But then when I saw what he was doing. And then I saw what Beeple was doing. This is like getting into October 2021? 2020, no, 2020. 2020, 2020, 2020, 2020. Yeah, that's definitely yeah. 2020. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Time flies. Um, Time warp, right? Yeah. 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 Wow. It, everything just like immediately clicked where I was like, oh, because I had also understood that COVID forced us in, into the confrontation with the idea that much of our socialization is happening in, in digital spaces, you know, especially for people like me who are kind of online native, digital natives, right? So many of my best friends are people I met through social media. So much of my interaction with those people is happening in social media spaces. So if we're going to have social communities, robust social communities online, we need ways to social signal. And one of the ways we social signal is with art and with ownership and with fashion and identity and avatars and, and, and you know, now uh, social audio. And like that's really, really robust social spaces. So I realized that just like we have art and objecthood in reality, crypto art and NFTs give us objecthood in our digital social spheres. And that that light bulb just like exploded over my head and I was all in, like all in in that moment. And that's actually when I'm about when I minted my first uh, NFTs on Block Party too. That's really that. awesome, man. Um, I want to talk to dive in deeper into all ships because you've introduced so many great artists uh, into the space through all ships. You know, for me, I think you and I think you introduced me to Ollie as my first music NFT, to be yeah, honest, love which Ollie. is like the rooms has been something that I've actually been awesome about it. Um, you also build community IRL. You host retreats. You do your Robertas. You know, like let's dive into what. What is the role that IRL plays in URL building community? Right. Very good question. That's a core ethos of, of all ships as well. Um, and just, just to connect the last conversation to this one. So basically, I realized that I started all ships as a reaction to what was happening on social media. But I didn't really have a plan besides I'm going to bring people together that I love and we're going to avoid it for a, for a few hours. Um when I discovered or was told about NFTs and it finally clicked, the analogy I use, it was like when they find the plans, the Death Star, and they're like, wow, like this is an impossible, you know, we're never going to win this battle. And then it's like, but there's this one little, <laughs> this one, little <laughs> one little vulnerability, just the size of a womp rat. Right. And so that's how, that's the analogy I give. I was like, oh my gosh, like there is a way not to just to blow up the Death Star, but like to, again, renegotiate our relationship with the internet. Now, uh, so that's basically all ships is my rebellion against some of the, the I think, more difficult parts of, of uh, Web2 platforms. Now, I also have a thesis that the bonds that we build online are very tenuous um, and they're very easy to break and very easy to walk away from. But when you are in the same room and you're breaking bread with somebody... And you are, you know, sharing a bottle of wine. You know, maybe there's a nice fireplace. Like that, that reinforces the relationships you make online, and it strengthens the communities that you're building online as well. And so, there, I'm very disinterested in being in communities that are solely online. I really, it just doesn't affect me in the same way that I'm down to build a community online for years, like we had to do with COVID, and then bring it back into reality. That's awesome. But if I don't have that IRL experience it it's not truly community for me yet it's kind of a it's a social network versus a community and i think that that's a really important distinction so to answer your question one of our priorities at all ships is to build intimacy uh to build a a really robust in person base layer for the communities that we want to build online as well 
And I, you know, I'm, I'm inspired by projects like, I mean, you guys do an incredible job with your, all your events, what you did in Miami, um, at gateway astounding. Um, I'm also very inspired by bright moments, what bright moments is doing in cities all over the world. Yeah. Seth and the team, their ability to create intimacy by doing these in-person mints. Like it's not, it's not, a, you know, it's not random that they're doing that. They're, no, doing, they're right. doing a very good job at building a community by making sure that um, as many people can, can do it in person as possible. Same with art blocks, you know, yeah. the Marfa experience was absolutely phenomenal. Um, so I'm, you know, I, I, uh, Stand on the shoulders of giants. <laughs> I feel you. I feel you. Well, fun fact, you know, Dave and I actually met prior years prior to the Web3 space um, at a SoFar Sounds event uh, oh, yes. where Ollie was playing, yes. you know, and shout out, Ollie Shannon. shout out Ollie and reconnected years later. And I remember the, the night that we reconnected was actually the night that Roger Dickerman did the uh, artifacts in Times Square. Yep. And, and that was my first time meeting him and paired in that first like URL to IRL connection. I have, so, the, I have that group picture of the three of you, man. So special. In Times Square. I'll send it to so you. So special. I, lo I love it. Um, but look, like one, Dave, one thing that I love about you is you are an evangelist for the space. Uh, I am as well. So I, I love to see it. Like I, we're, we're both believers that this will can and will fundamentally redefine how creators and communities share it in the value that they create together. Um, you have been instrumental in bringing a lot of photographers into the space. Uh, Minaris comes to mind. I know there are many others. Um, I'd love to hear your perspective. Where are we in terms of like mainstream adoption and in terms of like in terms of bringing people into a better sense of understanding around the opportunities uh, in Web3 within the photography space at large? We might still be a batting practice, man. Like, I, I think that there's so much. <laughs> like, I, it's either the first in, first pitch of the first inning or, you know, close to it. I, I just think that one of the things that happens um, in nascent communities is like we all feel like this is the most important thing in the world. And like, I actually think it is for creatives. But so many people just don't even haven't even wrapped their heads around why and don't care to yet that I think we have a long way to go. But I do think that what companies like Meta are doing is the way. And, you know, most people who will be interacting with blockchain in a couple of years won't even think about the blockchain anymore. And I think that's when we're going to be more like in the game. My biggest fear surrounding adoption is that you know, as for as many good things as there are in this space, there are also terrible things in this space. And there's, there's people who are using this technology to take advantage of people. And there's people that are just deeply irresponsible with their, um, confidence and their ability to execute in this space. And I think that that's a huge systemic risk to adoption. Um, I don't want to like, I'm not going to get specific on any particular projects, but there's, projects that had, a, had an opportunity, I think, to really, uh, you know, prove the use case for this technology. And, and you know, because of their um, maybe negligence in planning or their... Um, Call them out, bro. Uh, Call them out. <laughs> I just think that like a lot of... If, if I came into the space and I put my trust in a project to be a steward of my work on blockchain, it's blockchains forever, right? Yeah. Um, then I would be very reluctant to dip my toe in again if, if I felt like it didn't go well. And I think we've seen a lot of really like big name photographers, um, you know, try to enter the space and then maybe something didn't go right. And now I think it's going to be, they're going to be an advocate against this technology. And so I think we need to be very responsible when, especially when we approach, pe approach people that have very storied legacies and, I mean, I think some people are, are actually doing it very well. I'd rather focus on the, that kind of thing. So I think Fellowship Trust, Obscur Obscura DAO, um, uh, so many others. I think Guy Borden's uh, estate is doing an incredible job. Um, Joel Meyerwitz is doing like awesome stuff. Crudson. Um, so there are a lot of legacy photographers that get it. Joel Meyerowitz, especially, he's one of my favorite street photographers of all time. Like he's a legend. Amazing. And the way his like his captions on Instagram about why he's doing NFTs to probably one of the most militantly anti-NFT group of followers, it's it's very inspiring for me because he's such an icon. I mean, mm -hmm. and he gets it. He's like, this is just like selling prints. And if you don't want to print, like if you buy a print, you just have a print. If you want to buy, you know a digital print, you can buy a digital print. And this can help me, you know, this can help me continue to 
release archival work and things you've never seen before and we can build community this way. Like that's the way to think about it. But it's not an opportunity to just come in and sell an object and leave because that's a surefire way to leave a trail of disappointed um, community members behind. Yeah. And in that vein, when it comes to like upkeep and continuing to engage and bring value to your community, I'm curious the as an artist, as somebody that loves to create, oftentimes I'm sure you're in a state of flow when you're creating, but a critical part of building and growing your community and being able to lay a foundation of a successful career as a creator, as an artist, as a photographer is dependent on being able to balance that time creating with balancing that time in the, the business side, the community building side, the marketing side. How, how do you strike that balance, if even, or is it just always? Man, so I'm, I'm particularly bad at this. So I think it's a good question for me because I, I can actually answer, honestly, yeah. like looking at the gaps in my, yeah, my yeah. life. Um, the best thing you can do for yourself is ask for help. I mean, I, there's just things that I'm not good at. And there's things that, you know, I have a limitation to my technical ability that I will waste so much of my time trying to do it myself. So for example, Drip Drop, right? So Drip Drop is my collection of 1,111 puddles in Times Square. I, I, I giggle every time I say it because I'm like, damn, I, like, <laughs> I just had this idea and it works. I'm like, yes. That's a um, lot of puddles. It's a lot of puddles, man. <laughs> And, good, good thing uh, it rains a lot here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I, I, I want to dive into that project a little more. Yeah. But for the example here, you know, if I did that myself, like I'm just listing things manually on OpenSea and being like, "Do you, would, would you like a puddle, sir?" <laughs> the puddle peddler. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm but a humble puddle farmer. <laughs> May I interest you in my crop? <laughs> um, but I mean, all it took was me bringing that idea up to Ben Strauss. Uh, who's one of the, the, I think one of the best artists in the space, also uh, the co-founder of Transient Labs. I brought that up to him in Denver last year. Um, and I was like, hey man, I'm, like, I have this crazy idea. Like I'm super inspired by Snowfro, Chromie Squiggles, Artbox, Generative Art. I'm like, how do we take this project that I want to be like the Fidenzas of photography where it's like these like super abstract color uh, networks of like crazy information. Um, that are visually very aesthetically beautiful, but I want to make it like more like gen art, right? So he was like, well, what if we use machine vision to count all the different like emergent rarity of the drop? And then, so like we'll have a, a self-driving car algorithm that we modify to count ripples. Like it'll assign rarity to each one and then we can do the color and then we can do like the amount of change in, in like tone for like the chaos. And I was like, yeah, let's do that. But if I didn't, ask for the help. Mm -hmm. And frankly, like they made it so easy for me to do that. I sent images. They like created this entire system for me. And if I had tried to do that on my own, out of some sort of like sense of pride or, or, or the fear of asking for an assistance, that project wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't have sold out. It wouldn't be that relevant. It wouldn't be interesting. And now I feel like we've created something that was like the first of its kind, super compelling and interesting and philosophical and um, so I, I guess, yeah, I would just, I would say like, ask for help, but this applies to community management. You know, I, I, uh, work with my friend Sterling who helps me like manage my personal community, but also helps me manage all ships community. I work with, you know, Maria Sutherland, who you guys know, Maria is like, shout out Maria. Yeah, we love Maria. Been, uh, you know, a producer for me and a head of production on all my projects, almost all my projects for like a decade. Right. So knowing where my weak points are and finding the strongest people in the world to to prop up those weak points is the only way that I could ever even approach a modicum of success in this space. So yeah, just like find the people that want to, and, and those people love doing what they do. Like that's their craft, right? Yeah. So I think that's a really important thing to build strong teams. I mean, the three of you is a great example, right? Or four. Five, six? How many people are in here? Yeah. <laughs> Keeps multiplying. Oh, yeah, yeah. We're, we're growing. We're growing. We're growing. We're growing. We're growing. The whole team. Uh, you know, but yeah, I mean, it's, this isn't a one-man show. You know. Yeah, that's uh, amazing to hear, man. I think that the the phrase that comes to mind for me is called delegate to liberate, mm. right? Like when you delegate something to someone, you're not only liberating yourself from it, but you're liberating their genius. Right. to fly mm. right a lot of people see delegation as giving something away versus giving some empowering someone to take that genius and like thrive into it right and it removes that stressor of you um from that point man asking for help 
is a really great bridge to mental health. Mm. As you know, we're very passionate about mental health, me being an executive coach as well from that perspective, having gone through some burnouts in my life and helping those uh, to avoid it. Um, you know, you mentioned many times that social media, Instagram, Twitter, whatever it may be, whatever the platform may be, has been um, somewhat of a driving force in your stressors or in your, you know, mental health dec decline. Um, what do you think about mental health in Web3 with the 24-7, 365 concept? And then I want to go deeper into it after you're done with that, into psychedelics and psilocybin and yeah. mycelium, and we dive into it. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and I, I can connect the two as well. Like it. Um, okay. That's very fitting, considering the, the subject matter. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this, is a, this is a very important topic, um, generally, but also very important to me. So just to be very clear, I have dealt with like insane levels of anxiety and depression throughout my whole life. So like anyone else out there that's feeling that way, um, I feel you. <laughs> it's really crazy and it's like can be so disruptive and overwhelming. And um, I just want first want to say that like there are, there are many, many ways to, to make it better and to address it. And so like just if you're listening to this. Uh, I've been as low as I can go in my life and, um, but I'm good. And like, I, there's just don't like, don't lose hope. Like there's always a brighter day. So I want to say that, um, the, uh, the other thing I'd say is like, whatever the mental health concerns of web two were, I think they're very amplified in web three, frankly. Um, I'd love to be like, this is solving all my problems and blah, blah, blah. But frankly, it's it, the st just basically the stakes are higher, like, and it's a more intense. The other thing that's really important to realize is that we're, there is no web two and web three division. It's not a thing. Web, web three is grows on the substrate of web two. So like web three is this little ownership layer that is completely dependent on web two. There's no true separation. There's an ideological separation in how we engage with networks, but you cannot do web three without a web two presence. So none of that went away either. The one thing that I think has helped in Web3 is back to this identity and what I use which platform for. So I, when I started making um, a bit of uh, money through selling my art as NFTs, I felt this immediate sense of, oh, I don't have to, I don't have to go out and like make a reel today in order to keep up with the next person that this brand might hire instead of me. I felt like, oh, I have some creative runway. I can go do that crazy idea where I shoot a thousand puddles, right? Instead of, you know, and that to me is like a huge relief on my mental health. I get to, because I'm not beholden to a brand in Web3, I get to do the ideas that are truly me, like the puddle and like drive. Because um, the only people I'm beholden to are the people that are interested in collecting that work. And if they collected that work or they've committed to collect that work, they're satisfied. And like, I don't need to be like, what's going to happen tomorrow? What's going to happen the next day? Because my projects I'm building, building are for a life and beyond, right? I'm, I'm, these projects are going to outlive me if, if everything goes according to my plans, right? So I feel way less of the immediate pressure to create. And that's helped kind of make me feel a little bit better on the mental health side of things. Um, but again, Web3, the amount of participation that Web3 requires from any participant in the space is, I, don't, I mean, it just feels unsustainable. And if I see people, I mean, how many times have we seen a post that's like, taking a, taking a little break, I'll be back soon. <laughs> like, and then the next day they're like, hey. <laughs> <laughs> GM. Yeah, GM, I'm back. It's like, that wasn't long enough. Yeah, that was yeah. not. Go to the woods. Yes, touch some grass. Yeah, so, so I mean, just you got to be really, really careful, especially, you know, comparison is the thief of joy. Is, is, yeah, let's, let's talk about being careful. I know that that's a really good point of comparison to Deepa's joy. What are some of the guardrails or the, I think, constraints or boundaries that you have implemented to know <laughs> when, you're, when you're reaching? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Boundary. It's a, <laughs> that's a really good idea. I've never thought of that before. I think, well, I can, let, let me say this. Yeah, yeah please, The, com please, the comparison is, of, is the thief of joy is really important. And a constraint that I have for myself is like, don't look at what someone else is doing and be like, it doesn't make you less if, if they have a bigger success. Every artist succeeding is showing you a door that can open. Mm. 
Okay. So like, they're like, look, this door opens. You're like, oh shit. Success leaves clues, right? Yeah. It's yeah, like, yeah, yeah. oh, I can, I can do that too. Or you could be like, they open the door and you're like, I wanted to open that door. Like that was my door. Like which one is going to get you further, right? Right. So there's an infinity of doors every day. More doors are in front of you and you can open any single door you want. Other people opening doors shows you what's possible. And if you can have that as your framework and be like, oh, if he did it this way, like then I, maybe I can do it that way. For example, when Mad Dog Jones did Replicator, I was so inspired. I was like, oh my gosh, like you can use to like tokens as incentive mechanics for people's behavior like create like almost digital life forms that evolve and grow like a like a petri dish or something and that idea you know warped through my crazy photographer brain created the racing system of drive where i'm like i'm gonna hold 20 cars back in my garage the only way you can win them is to do creative things inspired by the project so you know every two months or so we have a photo contest that you have to take a photo in the style of drive, right? <laughs> um, and so, so I could either look at his, you know, he made millions off that replicator drop, right? I could either look at that and be discouraged and be like, oh, th that's a million dollars I'm not going to have. Or I could be like, oh shit, like I have an opportunity here to look at the mechanics Imagine the possibilities that exist because we have new technology layers, create something of my own. And then other then when other people come to me for ideas about their projects, I'm like, have you thought about holding back some of the supply? Have you thought about incentivizing? And like, we get to just keep sharing and participating in this global decentralized conversation about how to use this technology to further our artistic purposes. So I think mental health is largely about how do we frame um, the way that we compare ourselves to other people in our communities. That's really powerful. And so our second part, we need to do a disclaimer here, I think, before we go into mycelium. Like, again, like psilocybin is a scheduled drug. Yep. You know, it's not legal in the United States uh, from that perspective. And so we are not doctors here. We are not medical or licensed to prescribe anything. This has just been from anecdotes. I think it's really important to acknowledge that, you know, if you are dealing with depression or any psychological disorders, please see your doctor. Yep. This is not a one fits cure all like this is not, not a medical advice, advice. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> nor is this show financial advice but <laughs> yeah, 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 we're on the topic of disclaimers sure, yeah. we talk about make sure that, that it's fair you know because like so let's talk about let's talk about psilocybin let's talk about psilocybin and that role that it has had in your career in your mental health mm -hmm. and then we'll dive deeper into the world of mycelium and how that 100 percent, 100 percent. and and i'll add it my own disclaimer don't listen to anything I say. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, crazy. Uh, I'm crazy i'm uh wearing a, a bandana at eight in the morning um no so what i will say is you know personally for me in my life and my own personal experience not advice for anyone else Psilocybin has had like a pretty profound effect on my like ability to handle anxiety and depression. Like I just at different layers and at different times in my life, like I truly believe we've co-evolved um, with psilocybin and as in the same way that we've co-evolved with um, so many other substances and, and even foods. You know, like most of the foods we eat today don't exist without our, you know, intervention. But over tens of thousands of years, you know, we turn like a, a small grain into corn, right? That's one great example. It's like, who's really in charge of this relationship, right? Is it the corn or is right. it us? <laughs> because they're one of the, it's one of the most successful crops worldwide now, right? And same with so many other plants, um, like, you know, even marijuana and, and, and other, like alcohol and all these different things. So I, I truly believe that it's a, it has been an important part of our evolutionary process. And so for me, it's been an interesting thing to, you know, have in my life. I think one distinction here that's really important is that uh, mushrooms are not plants, right? right? I think like it's very much a lot of people will, like uh, classify them as plant medicine, but really um, they're a fungi. They're a kingdom in its own. Mm -hmm. They're actually very intelligent. Even some vegans don't eat mushrooms because they consider them to be alive or creatures that are alive. So just uh, want to point that clarification. How has like mycelium and the the world of fungi influenced your your perception of building community and your artwork? Great question. So some, some homework for the viewers and listeners. Um, the, I th I'd say like the 
pre-101 intro to this is um, Fantastic Fungi, the Paul Stamets documentary with Louis Schwartzberg, who's an incredible photographer, time-lapse artist. Um, that's the most, like, just watch that and you'll start to understand immediately what I'm talking about. But if you want to go a little deeper, there's a book called Entangled Life by Merlin Sheldrake, which is an incredible, the, the thing I like about that book is that it's a, a, the whole book is a comparison about internet systems and mycelium networks. Um, and so basically for those that might not know the entire ecology land ecology of uh, the world is supported and connected by mycelium networks, which are the root systems of mushrooms. Mushrooms are the fruiting body and the reproductive organ of, of, of a network that is just like in every little bit of soil. Um, and the cool thing and the reason that it is such an apt comparison to blockchain technologies is that mycelium networks are completely decentralized uh, in the sense that any part of the network can regrow the entire network. There's no center, center locus of control. And um, there's this whole marketplace and economy of nutrients. And they enter into these new Negotiation. negotiations and, and market uh, making <laughs> protocols with trees and plants in the forest. Trees and plants can't even live on land without a symbiotic relationship with mycelium networks. So, you know. There's this whole study about how um, uh, mycelium networks optimize even like they'll they'll move nutrients around their microtubule networks in order to optimize exchange rates within forest ecosystems. Trees can communicate with each other in forests across vast distances by sending impulses through the network of mycelium. Um, and so when you really, you know, if you run with the metaphor, you can see that I basically think the internet is a is a giant global digital mycelium, mycelium network, and um, if that's true, then you can look at how mycelium networks work and how they optimize the transfer of value, and you can be a node in your own you know mycelium network and understand how to best use the network to you know for your goals. Um, the other thing that's really interesting while we're on the topic is you could look at the if, if you go with the, that metaphor and you just, you know, commit to the, commit to the bit, um, a th an interesting thing to think about is the, okay, the, the mushroom, like the, think about an amanita, like the beautiful, um, like, uh, white speckled red mushroom, right? It's an alarm bell in the forest, right? It's, it's a meme. Yeah. It's the meme of the network where the entire network pushes this beautiful, visible work of art above the network, you know, says, look at me. And then that meme is the thing that distributes and, and propagates the network. Yeah. Just like memes in, you know, like on punk, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. punk's memes. Like yeah. it's the same thing. It's like our, the concentration of value in our network is, is focused in on these like create artistic sculptures that are growing out of the ground. And I think that's the same thing that's happening with art on blockchain as well. Like, you know, um, an X copy piece is like this beautiful ancient mushroom in this network, right? And it that has spores. Like the idea, the, the way that that propagates throughout the network is like the, the distribution of spores on the wind. So yeah, I'll take it all the way, baby. Let's go. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. Sam, you have anything else? To add yeah, there? yeah. I, mean, I know this is a topic you're deeply knowledgeable yeah. about and passionate about as well. So I'm curious when, now that we're on the topic, if yeah. we were to extrapolate upon other uh, interesting takeaways in community building, in blockchain, from mycelium networks, what comes to mind for you? And I think for me, one of the things is that the interdependence is so important, right? Like, um, mycelium can't survive without a substrate mm -hmm. right like it actually requires the ecosystem to provide it something in return right and so it's this incredibly paradoxical and symbiotic relationship where if something dies mycelium is there to take care of it and to deconstruct it and bring the nutrients back to uh, the ecosystem right or it brings new life to certain elements i also think that Mycelium is a great representation. I think we were thinking about, the, you were mentioning the negotiation, the exchange of nutrients. It's also incredibly empowering from a community building standpoint of being connected. When somebody says, for example, 
a mushroom it can also be a symbol of beauty, but also a mushroom is a symbol that something may be wrong within the mycelium, actually, right? It, the fruiting body says, hey, I need to reproduce. I've come to the, an extent of my life that I now need to reproduce because I don't think I can go on from this moment, right? So a mushroom can also be a signal or an ask for help, right? And it is incredibly empowering when we see the community of individuals who actually reach out and ask for help, right? So it's that little mushroom, that little signal it can also be a sign of beauty, can be seen as a sign of life, but sometimes it can also be a sign of asking for help, right? And so I've seen those elements of that. And I think also the beautiful thing about the cycle of mycelium is it's how important the human interaction is to the livelihood of mycelium and so the livelihood of community, right? Without people, psilocybin could not propagate across the world without um, people, any other substance or any other substrate or any other mushroom can actually survive, right? So we actually see the interdependence and similarly here, uh, one of the things that's really powerful is how, how well designed mushrooms have become to our own DNA. When you think about turkey tail for, you know, helping to heal your immune system, when you start thinking about reishi mushroom for your lungs, when you start thinking about lion's mane for your brain, when you start thinking about um, cordyceps, for you guys who watched Last of Us, do not, don't pay attention to that, but cordyceps are really powerful oxygenation and energy drivers, right? And each one of these have a different interaction with us, mind you. One of the things that I always say is when in doubt, throw it out, right? So if you come across any mushroom that you don't know what it is, um, please throw it away, right? Like, send it to me. Don't send it to me. Don't send it to me. There's a really fun quote um, that says, you can always eat a mushroom once. <laughs> mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. The other thing too that's really interesting is they've done a ton of studies on this stuff and really read Entangled Life or get the yeah. audio book. It's, so, it's changed the way I think about the entire world. But... One of the things that they've studied and proven is that plants that share a mycelium network yep. thrive and, and do much, 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 much better than ones that are isolated. Mm -hmm. And so that's a really, really important takeaway for community building. Yeah. And if you so, think about that, the honeycomb uh, mushroom is actually the largest uh, living organism in the world. And it actually is in the north and the Pacific Northwest. And it's actually like 22,000 acres or something along those lines. But when you think about the richness of the Pacific Northwest, right, is amazing. The trees, the, the foliage, the, the foliage the natural, all that, that's yeah. all driven through that network. Yeah. So uh, when you think about building communities, it's like no man is an island. You're not going to be it's funny, one of the best changes I think that the internet era has brought to us through every layer of the internet, but especially this layer, is there like I'm trying to think of an artist who could still be an asshole and get away with it. You know, like someone that's like, fuck everyone, I'm the shit, you know, like ah, I'm it's me. I'm like we're not interested in that anymore because we are all in the same social sphere now. Yeah. It used to be like the artist was like in this, you know, like like pedestal. Yeah. And, oh, and they could be a dick. And everyone's like, oh, he's just like, that's just how he is. Yeah. That's just not going to work anymore. Right. And I really like that. Like th there's been this veneer that's been washed off everything. And it's be like, you're going to be a dick. Like, forget it. Like, we're not interested in you. You're not part of our, our shared network. Right. And if I, the artists of the future are going to be the people that are the most, I think, benevolent yeah. and the most interested in helping other people because they will have the strongest networks yeah. and they will have the strongest shared networks of other people and, you know, in their ecosystem. So I think that's a really positive shift towards the right direction. Fascinating for sure. Well, as we get ready to close things out, we have a segment in our show, Bullish or Bearish, where we ask you and run through a list of different topics. You tell us whether you're bullish or bearish and a brief answer as to why. Let's start things off with a, a bull run for NFTs in 2023. Um, man, I don't know. I, I, I think... Either or, baby. Ah. Bullish or bearish? All right, bullish. Okay. Ooh. Why? Ooh. Um, you said I wouldn't have to explain myself. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> no, like literally, like I, I just think this technology is here to stay. I think the that the bull run of like twenty, what was it, twenty twenty one, was like euphoria and like way too much. So I don't think that should be our like metric on what a bull market is. But anymore. we do welcome that again. Yeah, we're here for you. Not bad at that. Not bad at that. All right, bullish or bearish, NFT now. Oh, bullish. 
Love of course. To hear it. Love Here's to hear the payment. <laughs> <laughs> Love to hear it. Uh, bullish or bearish? Benny Redbeard. Oh, is there another word I could use? <laughs> Benny. I'm euphoric. Yeah, 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 yeah. 100%. Like. What's the peak of that shark? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Before it crashes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Top signal. Right? I'm going to bull trap. Yeah. <laughs> now, Benny, just while we're on the topic, I mean, I, like, Benny is. He'll, I can't wait for, for him to listen to this because he'll just like turn beat red. And yeah, 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 no, yeah. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> Benny, you were one of the most supportive people to so many, and not just me, to no, every no. artist in the space. I don't know how you do it, um, but you're an incredible human being. So uh, extreme bullishness on, on Yo, Benny beyond. Redbeard. Beyond. I'm yeah. going to double down on that. Yeah. 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 Shout out, Benny. Take, love- and take some credit, sir. Last one. Yeah. AI photography. AI photography. Um, I'm, I'm bullish on AI. Look guys, it's like, it's crazy. It's scary how good it is. Um, and of course there's things to be worried about and it's terrifying, but like, like this is a tale as old as time. Like technology comes along and most people hate it and it's not going to go away. So like either learn how to live with it or how to use it, um, to your advantage or how to differentiate yourself from it. But I always say this, uh, but it's like, there was a caveman who hated fire, right? <laughs> like, there was a painter who hated canvas. Like everyone hates disruption. And I think one of the most bullish signals in the world is when there's a huge blowback to some form of new technology. And, you know, like with Bitcoin, NFTs, like ordinals and stuff like this, right? Like so many people are so mad about it that I'm like, it's probably going to be a yeah. thing. Yeah, <laughs> probably yeah, a thing. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I don't know. I don't know anything about it yet. But, you know, when I see people getting so worked up, that's where I'm. I'm yeah, it's a good signal. Pro- probably nothing. Yeah. <laughs> Last uh, but not least, what are you excited about? And this does not have to be bullish or bearish. Right? We hope it's bullish. But uh, what's coming up? What are you looking forward to? I just hope we can continue to help artists decouple themselves from some of the more nefarious corporate interests. Um, I, I think that... You know, if you can get a thousand people to give you 0.1 ETH, I mean, that's a good living. So, yeah. so um, I hope this can continue. I hope that artist royalties are are preserved or, and if not like technic- technologically, I hope they're preserved uh, as a social um, contract. I think it's very important, like tipping, whatever. Um, and I'm excited to continue to grow my various projects and explorations in the space and especially all ships. Yeah. I have a winter collection that might be out by the time this comes out. I don't really know, but you heard it here first. It's called Snowfall, and uh, again, like you know, people who believe in me are gonna are uh, gonna be very happy with the way I'm doing this. I think so. this drive Snow- is not for sale. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah like look, um, full disclosure, uh, I'm a, I'm a holder mm-hmm. of your artwork, you know, uh, in drips, and I'm definitely looking to get into the drive aspect just for. Uh, disclaimers and not financial advice concepts here. So I just wanted to address a huge believer in you and you Thank personally. You, likewise. Yeah, man. yeah, likewise, I'm a believer in what you guys are doing. I think, you know, you guys giving artists such a, you know, professional platform and such a wide distribution network to share their ideas and to, you know, disseminate their art and information and philosophy with people is such a core component of what what helps artists succeed in these information layers. So I'm really, really grateful to be here. And I'm so glad to know you guys as friends as well. Thank you, brother. We need to take some mushroom. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you do. Man, man, after that conversation, <laughs> yeah, yeah. we absolutely need to, man. Uh, Sam, what stood out to you on that conversation? I was fascinated by the kind of parallels between mycelium networks and what that means from, I mean, it's, it's almost like a carbon copy of blockchain in certain perspectives by way of the decentralized decision making and, and communal ownership and communal participation. I think it's a fascinating uh, metaphor and analogy. So that to me was very interesting to learn more about. That's really awesome. Matt, for you, man, what, what really stood out? Yeah, well, look, like one of the things that's really interesting is that with Web3, we're so early that it's too early for playbooks, right? And so I thought it was so interesting to hear Dave speak really eloquently about how he drew inspiration from the likes of Mad Dog Jones and Snowfro and like into a very like actionable and quite strategic plan for maintaining value for his one of ones while strategically and thoughtfully increasing his collector base, that ring theory with drip drop, with drive and the like, and continually to drive value back to those one of one holders. Like he's writing the playbook right there. So uh, any creators who are listening, I hope you paid attention to that part.
yeah for me man i think the most important thing is like his authenticity is just so real like you can't not fall in love with him when you're having a conversation and like his drive of generating and producing value right like he was always referencing how his early collectors are rewarding them how he made them whole with the next iteration right not not having to sell that previous one and then just like his like true vulnerability of speaking to mental health and like his journey and his challenges and also his upsides of these elements right and I think the Web 2, Web 3 conversation of how the social media and the birth of all ships came about, right? How all that weaves together coming back to the, the art of creation, that thing of like him putting his soul on the blockchain, his soul on everything that he creates to generate and produce value. That's really what stood out for me. Yeah. Well, super fun conversation. Definitely be sure to dive deeper into Dave's work if you haven't already. Definitely be sure to subscribe to the podcast if you haven't already, nftnow.com. Definitely be sure to tune in next week when we're back. But until then, thank you so much for your continued support. And until then, we are out. Thank you.